Hello. Um, can I just explain what I'm aiming to do? What I'm going to say is based almost entirely on one sentence in the New Testament. All the rest is fiction. But I like to try and get inside the heads and uh, personalities of ordinary people caught up in the most extraordinary circumstances. Things that were going to change the whole history of the world. And I like to try and imagine what it will be like. So, here goes. <clears throat> My name is Brutus. I was born in Rome. Nothing to do with the assassination of Julius Caesar. That happened a long time before I was born. Born in Rome, my parents named me Brutus. And I grew up in Rome, a great city. I was very proud that I'd actually been born there. When I was 16, I joined the army, something I'd wanted to do for quite a long time. I always admired Roman soldiers. I joined as an ordinary legionnaire and uh, gradually over several years worked my way up until a very proud day came when I was made a centurion. Centurion, originally centurions had a hundred men, that's where the name came from. But by the time I was made a uh, centurion, there were a lot more men under my command. For one thing, most of the ordinary men had servants. And there were more, they'd increase the numbers. So I had charge of or anything between 175 and 200 men under my command. I would give them orders and they would obey. Very well disciplined. We were part of a regiment called the Italian Regiment. Now, in order to qualify for being in the Italian reg Regiment, you had to have been born in Rome itself. So that's where I'm coming from. Serving the Roman Empire, I did a short spell in um, amongst the Germanic people who hated the Romans. And that was probably the only time I engaged in any proper fighting. And then I was told I was going to be moved. I was going to be sent to a place called Palestine. When I heard the news, my heart sank. The Jews that lived in Palestine were very strange people, and all the problems revolved around religion. Now, I've never been a religious person. I go to the temple sometimes. I give lip service to the worship of the emperor, which we're supposed to do. And I go to the shrine. I go sometimes when they have these uh, big feasts in the, temp in the various temples, just have a big rave up really. But apart from that, I'm not, I don't think too much about that. But the Jews, well that's different. I knew enough about them to think I'm in for trouble. They have this very strange belief that there was only one God. Anyway, we packed up and uh, we set sail and eventually landed in Palestine. I must admit, I was very pleasantly surprised. It turned out to be a really beautiful country. Big Lake in the north and Jerusalem, a beautiful city with a great big temple. That was out of bounds for us. The Roman governor was named Pontius Pilate. When he first arrived in Jerusalem, he put a statue of the emperor in their temple. And my goodness, that caused some trouble. There were riots, and he received his orders from Rome, take it out and put it somewhere else. So there's a separate shrine now for the, for the emperor. And the temple is out of bounds for Roman soldiers. 
The Jews look after it themselves. One day I got my orders. The following day I was to take part in a crucifixion. Three men were going to be executed. Now it wasn't the first time I'd done it. I don't like it. I'm a soldier trained to fight. I'm not an executioner really. But I knew how to do it and I'd worked it out. And so I got a detachment of four men and myself. And we got ready to carry out the crucifixion the next day. I got the orders. A man named Barabbas and two other men, two of his followers. Well, that gave me a bit of satisfaction. Barabbas was a, a sort of small-time gangster, really. Bandit, hid in the hills. Every now and again he came and attacked a, a small party of Roman soldiers. Took them by surprise. That was their big element. They usually managed to kill one or two and then went off into the hills. I don't know who caught him. I'm glad he was caught because I'd lost at least four men to this man Barabbas. So they got him and two of his followers. So I felt a bit better. I don't mind crucifying him. So the next day we went to a place where they carried out executions, a place called Golgotha. Never quite sure why they call it that. The rocks had strange shape, looked like a little bit like a skull. That's what that word Golgotha means, place of a skull. Now they may have got the name from the shape of the rock. It may have been because that's where they carried out executions, I don't know. But that's where we went. Another party of Roman soldiers were dealing with uh, Barabbas, or so I thought. But then, early on, as we were preparing the crosses and getting ready for them, the orders were changed. I had a new uh, lot of orders. It wasn't Barabbas, it was someone else. Barabbas had been set free. Set free? That's what had happened. By orders of the governor. A man named Jesus. Jesus from Nazareth. Now I'd heard of him. In fact, all that I'd heard of him was good. He had caused trouble, had caused riots. He was a preacher of some kind, a teacher going around the country, reputed to have worked miracles. In fact, another centurion up in the north by Galilee he got a servant that he really loved you. And this servant was ill and he sent for Jesus. And Jesus healed him without even going there. It was wonderful, really. I heard of people who were blind being made to see again. There was a case only a few weeks ago of a young man named Lazarus who died and he'd been dead for four days, and Jesus was supposed to have gone to the tomb, called out his name, and he came out alive. Well, for me, that was a bit too far. I, I couldn't really believe that. But a lot of people did, and they came, they'd seen him. About a week ago, there was a bit of excitement. There was a sort of procession with Jesus of Nazareth riding on a donkey into Jerusalem didn't really cause any trouble, a lot of noise, a lot of shouting, a lot of cheering. And then they all went into the temple and whatever was happening there wasn't our concern. So we just let it go. Now they were going to crucify him. I started asking around what's happened. And to my complete surprise, I found out it was Jews, its own people. 
that had insisted that he be crucified, that shouted for him to be crucified. Now Jews on the whole hate crucifixion. They have nothing to do with it. Even Herod, that so-called puppet king, he won't crucify people. So why? And all the while, the, 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 right through that day, this question kept hammering into my mind. Why? Why am I crucifying this Jesus? But I got my orders. And I was waiting and a little sort of procession came. With people there, some of them weeping and wailing. A lot of women, much to my surprise. And Jesus staggering along with a crossbeam. Somebody helping him. A black man. And when I saw him, I don't think I've ever seen anyone who had been knocked about more than he had. He'd been scourged, and his back was open, the wounds were open and bleeding still. Somebody, for some reason, had put a, a lot of thorns on his head in the shape of a crown. And there was this accusation that I might have passed to the cross over his head. Now I don't understand their language, but this was in three languages. I understood one of them. Jesus, King of the Jews. Oh, interesting. And he came. It was different to any other crucifixion. Crucifixion is a horrible death. We put the crossbeam down on, at least this is how I do it, put the crossbeam down on the floor. And then we take it and drive nails through the person's wrists. Normally they shout, they curse, they scream. And it takes three or four men, to, well it takes three men usually to hold them down. And then the other one drives in the nails. But Jesus just lay there quietly. He said something. I didn't understand, but one of the soldiers understands their language. I said, what did he say? And he said, he's just asked his God to forgive us because we don't know what we're doing. Well, I've never, never come across that before. And when they drove the first nail through his wrist, instead of the scream and the curse that we were used to, there was just a deep sigh and intake of breath. You could tell him it, 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 it hurt him really bad. But he didn't struggle. I took his other wrist, put the second nail in, and then lifted it up and put it on the cross of upright, nailed the two pieces together, and then twisted his legs round until his two heels were together, and they put a nail right through, which is probably the worst part of all. But still, no cursing, no shouting, just this deep intake of breath, and what seemed like a sigh. We take all his clothes off. They were lying on the floor. The other two men were brought up now. I don't know why Barabbas had gone free and that his two followers were being crucified. We got all the usual cursing and shouting and screaming with them, but not, not with this Jesus of Nazareth. People do crucifixion in different ways. When I crucify somebody, the feet are usually about 
a meter above the ground. Not right like, her, like some people do it. And there he was. And the most remarkable thing was, there were people watching, women. And people shouting abuse at him. Now normally, these Jews shout abuse at us when we crucify somebody, but it wasn't, they were shouting abuse at him. I understand a little bit of what they were shouting. Challenging to come down off the cross. There were three women that got very close, and a man was with them as well. I tried to push them back, but they wouldn't go back, they were very close. And I said to one of the soldiers, do you know who those three women are? And he said, well the middle one is his mother. I couldn't believe that. His mother, here, at the cross. He said something to her, and he said something to the man that was there as well. And the man that was there took the mother and took her away. To be absolutely honest, I felt quite relieved. And so it went on. It came up towards midday. And something began to happen, which was very strange. It started to go dark. I looked. It wasn't an eclipse or anything like that. But the sun seemed to go dark. It was a strange sort of mist blotting out the light of the sun. And it got darker. Even the birds went quiet, and everybody went quiet. It's almost impossible to speak if you're being crucified, because your lungs are crushed. crushed. This is why people die, how people die. But this man, Jesus, managed it. It was dark for about six hours altogether. And then suddenly he called out something. I said, what's he shouting? And they said, it's a sort of prayer. Why have you forsaken me, God? I looked at him. And then he shouted, no, I did recognize this. He shouted one word, to tetelestai, means finished. The thing that they shout when somebody's running in a race and finishes. The telestyle. And he shouted it at the top of his voice. I would not have believed that a man being crucified could shout like that. And then in a much quieter voice, he said something else. What did he say? And my interpreter said, what well, he just said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Just at that moment, I felt the ground shake. A sort of earthquake. I was told afterwards that in the temple, that great big veil that they got in the temple, great big curtain, a torn in two from the top to the bottom. It was really eerie. Now, as I said, I'm not a religious, or I wasn't them, I wasn't a religious man at all. But I looked at that man, just died of crucifixion. The darkness was beginning to go and the sun was beginning to come out again. And I said, this man must have been the son of God. Well, it went on. These Jews are very hypocritical. It was their special day, something they called the Passover. That's what the, all the fuss was about. And we had orders that the 
we got to finish it and the men have got to be taken down from the cross. So they came and broke the legs of the first and then the third one, but Jesus was already dead. Just to make sure I got my spear. And I pushed it up and water came out of his side and blood. And that was weird really because the person becomes dehydrated, there's no water to come out. And the blood is all drained out as they've been crucified. But I saw it and I can witness that that's true. That's what happened. But he was dead. A bit later on two men came, very well dressed. They got permission from Pontius Pilate to take down his body. Well, I've, I've got the order written, so I let them do it. And they wrapped him in some cloth and carried him away. That was the end of it. But you know, it wasn't the end of it. Shortly afterwards, rumours began to circulate. He was alive. This, this Jesus was alive. They'd actually put a guard over his tomb. They don't normally put a guard on the grave. And somebody said, oh well, when the two soldiers of guarding it were asleep, the disciples came and stole his body. Roman soldiers going to sleep on duty. If that was true, they'd both be dead by now. There was something very strange going on. And then somebody started to say, well, he wasn't really dead. He was just unconscious that when they put him in the cold grave, he came round again. <laughs> I, I, I've crucified people. <clears throat> Believe me, he was dead. Now that all happened a long time ago. I was still in Palestine. I decided to retire. <clears throat> and I've got myself a house quite close to the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful place. And I'm going to stay here for the rest of my life. You see, something else happened. <coughs> People were going around telling the story of this Jesus. I heard it. And just after I retired, living by the Sea of Galilee, I started to ask questions. And they sent a man named Peter. And he talked to me all about Jesus. And I gave my life to Jesus. It's made such a difference. I pray to him. I meet with other Christians. That's what that started to call us, call us Christians. And here I am, at the end of my life, remembering that day. I said to Peter, you know I can't be a Christian. I can never be forgiven. I am the man that crucified Jesus. And Peter said, you can be forgiven. And God will receive you and make you one of his children. And he did. And I will end my days happily, looking forward to the time when I come face to face with the man I crucified.